Well, thanks everybody. I'm gonna get us started. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Billy Shore. I'm the founder and executive chair of Share Our Strength and our No Kid Hungry campaign. And I've, I've, we've of course been working with all of you, some for a very long time and uh, some more recently around our response to COVID-19. Um, we're gathering today and I'm gonna ask everybody to introduce themselves uh, in just a moment, but we're here today for a really, what feels to me like a really special con conversation with Angelina Jolie, who is the special envoy for the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees and has been involved in humanitarian work. I think Angelina, you've just on the UN side alone, 19 years. Uh, so a long uh, and powerful track record of caring about uh, the most vulnerable and those who are suffering in humanitarian crises, and particularly uh, caring about those who don't always have as strong a voice of their own as they need to have, which is the children, that uh, is something that so many of our organizations have in common. Just uh, you know, share our strengths work over the last four to six weeks has been to pivot quickly and to support every organization uh, that we can that is working to replace the meals that kids depended on in schools but are no longer getting because the schools are closed. We've made, I think, seven and a half million dollars of grants in the last three weeks to about 290 organizations across virtually every state except I think one or two. Uh, by tomorrow, we'll do another $2 million in grants. These organizations are doing everything from setting up grab and go sites outside of uh, schools to working with nonprofits or food banks or YMCAs or community organizations. So it's really been a remarkable uh, kind of grassroots surge of effort to replace these meals. Uh, we're gonna have an opportunity to hear from everybody on this call and we'll have some specific questions as well. But um, as I say, Angelina Jolie has been a terrific champion. Um, I guess I didn't even mention this, that you're also a very accomplished Academy Award winning actor, but I think of you as a humanitarian and as an activist, Angelina, Thanks. I didn't want to overlook that. Um, and, and of course, you've been a, a, a super no get hungry champion uh, as well. So let me turn it over to you to say a few words and then we'll, we'll hear from everybody else on the call. Well, for so I do. I just I'm I'm really uh, humbled to meet all of you. I know how much work you've been doing. I know that right now that you're you've been risking your lives and going on the front line and helping these children to survive this time. And I just have enormous amount of respect to you for you and gratitude. And um, I just I can't imagine uh, what it must be like to to be out there and see the needs and. Um, and, and understand the, the deep realities of this because even reading about it and catching myself up to all of your work has been very emotional to just mm -hmm. learn about the realities across this country. Angering, in fact. Um, I, we were speaking before uh, just a moment uh, ago about just this country and how we've gotten to this place and how it's possible that there are so many children in need and families in need and that the government itself and the programs and the, the ways to protect our own and support our own aren't, aren't done and that all the work that you've had to do. Um, and thank God you've been there all these years long before the pandemic. So, so really, thank you. Um, and on this call, I want to learn from all of you about the work you do, um, um, help, help maybe people, maybe people know, know of the people, of the people who are receiving, receiving uh, what, uh, what it is that you do and what you're seeing. seeing. And, and if, if, I, if, I, if it's, it's possible, possible, we have time, we have time to, talk to talk about maybe, maybe what, 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 what more we can do, we can do as, citizens, as citizens, but also, but also what, what we can push or push hope or hope that our government and leaders, and leaders should, should be doing, be doing um, um, across, across the board. The board. So, so that's it. Thank, thank you so thank much, you so much for taking the time to talk to, talk to me. But, but thanks, Angelina. You know, the one, one other thing I was just going to ask you to speak to before we open it up is you get asked to do so many things and you're involved in so many issues. Um, I had a feeling it would just be inspiring for all of us to hear a little bit more about how you personally decided that this issue of, of hunger in our country was, was so important to you. Oh, well, you know, I have, you mentioned I've worked, worked for about 20 years with, with HCR and worked th thinking, growing up thinking, I want to help the most vulnerable people in the world. I traveled, I saw people uh, mm. work food lines myself to, to help people in camps and 
saw the rations disappearing, and, and still we, we have 70 million people displaced and you know, half are with their children, and the rations are very low. I don't think any uh, camp is uh, where we have rations met uh, by over 50%. So the being aware and, and watching the food go into the hands of a family and see that family try to switch that food and, and what that means. Um, and I, I knew that there were problems in America, I knew that there was poverty, I could not believe when I realized how many school children in America were dependent on a meal to not go hungry. I really, I was so uh, disgusted that we have gotten to this point as a country and that we would let the most vulnerable be in such a state and so dependent. I can't imagine what it feels like for those parents because I, I know one of the hardest things for people who become refugees is they want to work. They want to sweat and work, make something, and then give it to their children. And so not only are they not able to do that, but in order to feed their children, they have to, they have to you know, ask for it. They have to depend on aid. They have to beg for it. And, it, and what it does to them as human beings. Um, so just the whole, what it does to families, what it does to children. And so I, I just, I read about everything all of you were doing, and I just wanted to be, be, be with you. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna start with you, uh, Jennifer Labar, and ask you to just say uh, a word or two about the work that you've been doing and a word or two about how that work has pivoted to what you're doing now, and we'll hear from everybody on the call, and then we'll open it up. Hi. Jennifer Labar, I am the executive director for San Francisco Unified School District, and I've been in the school food world for about 20 years now. I'm working in Oakland Unified and now in San Francisco. And, um, you know, before pandemic, I'm working with No Kid Hungry to expand access to meals through the breakfast in the classroom programs and breakfast after the bell. And now with the pandemic issue, we are doing um, upwards of um, since then, we've done 383,000 meals um, through our grab-and-go program at 18 schools. We're also doing door-to-door -door delivery for our children with um, allergies and also our special ed students. And um, think about Blue Apron, um, using our basically Blue Apron boxes for those families. And then we're also um, working with our community-based organizations as well to um, help provide some meals for our adults as well in the community. Great. That's what Thanks, Jennifer. Is. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Catherine D'Amato, let's hear from you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Catherine D'Amato. I'm the CEO and president of the Greater Boston Food Bank, a little bit different model of the acquire, restore, and distributor food to uh, about 550 agencies in the eastern part of Massachusetts. So like everybody else, we're seeing enormous surge. It's almost 100% increase in the distribution of food and children are among many. We do have a, a, pretty, a very robust emergency uh, meal program through the public school system in Massachusetts, about 1300 sites actually across the state. So very active and uh, the low participation. We're, we're trying to match up our pantries along with each one of those sites across the state so that families can access more food and not just their, their daily, which is great for zero to 18. And I think that's an example of a huge accomplishment of being able to get the zero to 18 year olds to access that food in our school system right now, and then to match up the families. So we're just seeing unprecedented numbers. Um, as I said, uh, uh, our largest distribution was in the month of March, which is not surprising, of uh, about 7 million meals in the month of March alone. Um, and Catherine, your colleague, uh, Christina Perez is with us also. Hi, I'm Christina. Um, I'm our Senior Manager of Community Initiatives, and I manage all of our direct distribution programs, um, which include a lot of um, school-based pantries and other mobile markets that feed kids and families. Um, and over the last month, we've been really working with sites to either add distributions, um, to send more food for the additional families they're seeing, um, and to help them figure out how to pair these distributions with um, their distributions of school meals where families are already coming to the sites um, and trying to help them figure out how to do it as safely and as quickly as possible. Awesome, thank you. Um, Jerry Baker, the executive director of One Spirit, and I know you're here with two colleagues as well. We'd love to just have each of you introduce yourselves. Thank you very much. 
actually so impressive to hear everybody else and what everybody else is doing. Uh, One Spirit was founded back in 2005 and being the Lakota people at, throughout in, in finding their own feet of, being, of becoming self-sufficient, of defeating the poverty in which they were very, uh, very well known to live in. Uh, what we found there were, were actually amazing people who, as most of you have said, who, and certainly as the stories that, that Angelina, you have talked about, uh, people who want to do for themselves, they don't want somebody else to come in and do for them. And, uh, and so we have played that role with them of finding resources, of working as partners with them to, first of all, provide food, but to also find ways for the food to become uh, sustainable, for the food sources to become sustainable. Um, this was for all the years before the pandemic and during uh, several emergencies out there, we have worked uh, diligently alongside of them to find the resources that they need to provide what their, what their people need. Pine Ridge Reservation is home to about 40,000 people, uh, Lakota Native Americans. And besides being the most beautiful people that you could imagine wanting to, to work with, they also uh, live in, in poverty. Um, many of them live in poverty and there are very small houses where um, more than 10 people live in a family with three very small three bedroom houses. Uh, Right now, the fear there, and, and certainly uh, Steve and, and Bam, who is with me, uh, will be able to tell you more about that, but the fear that is there now of the pandemic and what it can do under these circumstances to devastate this population. So our job during the pandemic has been to, uh, to begin to do the, as much prevention as we can. Can we uh, stock food up? Can we uh, make masks? Can we... Interestingly enough, the one thing besides stocking food that, that a lot of people don't have access to is cleaning supplies and disinfectants and things that are not provided under the government subsidies mm -hmm. uh, so that they don't have diapers, they don't have toothpaste, they don't have the things that are necessary or disinfecting bleach, uh, laundry supplies that, they, that will help them prevent the invasion of a virus. And so we've been able to work with people to get that in as also as well as the food for the homes and for the kids. Uh, so we, we do have, we did build a youth center, they built it, we helped provide the resources. Uh, so we have a youth center that comes out, we support the uh, suicide prevention program that goes out now and, and distributes food to the people. Uh, we support several homeless programs uh, that support, that provide food uh, and several soup kitchens. So, you know, there's a lot of probably, uh, over 7,000 people a, a month that get food through hmm. through us and um, more than that now. Okay, well, we're gonna drill down on that a little bit more in just a moment or two. Uh, and so uh, Steve Hernandez and, and Bam Brewer, uh, would love you each to introduce yourselves. Well, hello everybody, my name is, I'm Steve Hernandez. And like Jerry said, um, I help out with the feeding program for um, One Spirit here on Pine Ridge. Um, she mentioned about the, 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 the difficulties of us being able to provide these things. A lot of people see um, in, in a city, a lot of these kind of facilities and these processes of how to be able to help people are, are in place. And so when we, when we approach it, there's a lot, a lot of things there. We try to work with the tribe a lot to try to work and um, maximize our efforts out there and some of the things that are doing. Logistically, it's been real hard because of the, the vastness of our, of our area, um, trying to be able to get things um, to people that live out in rural areas. Um, not, not, not a lot of paved roads, um, and then, like Jerry mentioned about even getting basic supplies, you know, stores are few and far between out here. And what people, most people think of, you know, stores are a convenience stores off the reservation are, that's pretty much what we have to deal with, you know, prices are high for stuff if you're able to get it. There's never fresh vegetables, um, you know, and everything like that. So we really face a mounting, um, uh, you know, crisis of anything like this pandemic when it comes in, because we're already down at the bottom. We're already just struggling just to try to maintain. And when something like this comes on, it's an even a harder stressor because now we're competing with not only, um, you know, people for the, on our reservation trying to get stuff here, but also off the reservation um, when all this hoarding and stuff goes on. We're, the, we're already the last. And so having to compete against that is even harder for us. And so that's what we try to address some of those issues and trying to, um, you know, work with different organizations. And we've been real lucky um, to be able to help um, as many people as we had down here. Good. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and Bam. If you'll uh, unmute yourself, I know you're not standing on the Golden Gate Bridge as it looks like you are, but uh, tell us tell us where you are and what you're doing. Well, <clears throat> hello everybody. I'm Bam Brewer. 
Oglawasu uh, tribal member. I'm the manager of the food program, uh, the firewood program, um, and I also manage the Buffalo House. The um, we we I started with One Spirit probably ten years ago, I think, and um, we you know pass out a lot of food food boxes a month and um the interesting part i guess is i i just talked to jerry baker and i said i'd kind of rather be known for the guy who passed out bring back the buffalo to the people and so it was really a long project but we basically built a buffalo house so that we could bring back the the buffalo to our people the nice. all natural grass fed um uh, meats to help the immune system, the health of the people. And as this pandemic kind of <clears throat> gets closer and closer, I'm, I'm glad we we are right now um, trying to get our people stocked up with, uh, you know, buffalo and stuff like that so that we could have some good, healthy uh, meats. And because, you know, the, the stores are starting to get kind of weird here. So, but with that, I'll just say I'm thankful and glad to be a part of uh, this phone call here today. Thanks, Pam. Uh, thanks very much. And last, uh, Caitlin Peacock, who's the executive director of the Tampa Bay Network to End Hunger. Hi. Um, yeah, so as, as uh, Mr. Shore mentioned, I'm Caitlin Peacock, the executive director of the Tampa Bay Network to End Hunger, and we're a tri county anti hunger um, network of over 350 members. Um, about a third of our members are the direct service providers. And really what we strive to do is bring people together to work on projects um, and sharing information. We do a lot of data and research analysis and pilot programs. Um, and due to the COVID coronavirus pandemic, we launched a home delivery meal program called Meals on Wheels for Kids aiming to serve the children that are transportation disadvantaged and food insecure. And we were able to launch it the first day of the school closure because of No Kid Hungry. Um, and, uh, and really, you know, we work in partnership with the school districts, um, you know, working strategically. When folks call our intake line for the Meals on Wheels program, you know, we let them know of, of other resources in the community and um, you know, if we gather information during the intake process and determine that they're transportation disadvantaged due to either they don't own a car or head of household is disabled um, and can't safely get them to a school distribution site. So um, anyway, it's a, it's a gap filling program and, and we've just been really blessed to help, um, help meet the need and, and we deliver a week's worth of groceries. Um, to the families to try and help them stay in, just like we all um, are striving to do. Um, and um, we're also um, going to be giving them masks and gloves um, as soon as we um, get our order in. But um, but yeah, due to COVID, we, we launched the Home Delivered Meal Program for Kids, very similar to the senior program, but aiming to to reach the kids that have been affected by the school closure specifically. Well, thanks, Caitlin. Thank all of you for uh, both the work you're doing and for taking some time to share it with us today. Um, I wanna, I've got a bunch of questions, Angelina, you probably do too. Um, can I start with a question, Angelina, or do you have one? So, so I had this, this um, you know, the, just the question about that, about SNAP, if we, maybe people who may be seeing this or what, what is SNAP and, you know how can it be improved and what is being i know there's uh, you know on the table now that we're, we're all asking for it to be improved but but what um what now during the emergency and maybe even past the emergency what are things that have always been um, a problem yeah I, yeah one of the things that and certainly on the reservation it may be different than what uh other people have seen out you know in 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 all that you're doing uh but on the reservation there housing is is critical and so there are many, many people living, family members living in one house. So one household often contains more than 10 people. And it may be three bedrooms, right? But the, the snap that comes in 
will last a, a short time. Not everybody in there may be covered under SNAP or under the commodities. They also, they get a choice of making uh, at times SNAP or of receiving SNAP or commodities, right? Uh, this will last a short time. So our food program comes in uh, at a time when these, these uh, subsidies are running out, right? However, the, the thing that we have heard since we've been there is the lack of, of personal hygiene supplies, of cleaning supplies, other things that go along with this that is absolutely necessary, uh, mm -hmm. certainly with a pandemic. I mean, before we've heard many times uh, of people, who, kids who have foot fungus, who have other problems uh, that would have been helped if they could have had laundry supplies, if they could have had a disinfectant, if they could have had other mm -hmm. things. This is an area that is um, known and, and as 80% people living in poverty, 80% unemployment, uh, there's not a lot of money here, right? Uh, so they, we started building laundromats for people so that they could get their um, get clothes clean, get their household linens clean. Uh, but these things are really important. That even diapers for babies or, or women's personal hygiene uh, items are often not available because the subsidies do not allow them to buy them. <laughs> Uh, Catherine D'Amato, I think you were trying to get yeah. into. <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, Angelina, the things when you think about policy shifts, so there, there are a couple really immediate ones. One is, it always strikes me that in an emergency, we can have an emergency SNAP, uh, you know, format to quickly do a one sheet, you're, you're in, you're good. But we can't right. do that in normal life. So right. one of those is, how do we get to use, how do we get to make it less burdensome on the person who is seeking food. I think the second is how do we raise that minimum to $30? That's another thing that we're trying to move is how do you move that up so that individuals can have access to more food? And the third is hot food in retailers. So they can't go to a hot food bar and grab, they can't get a roasted chicken but they and walk out with it with their SNAP dollars. So we have seen a 300% increase in applications in Massachusetts uh, in the last few weeks. So it is, and among elders, we're seeing a hundred percent increase among their utilization. So it's an absolutely awesome program, um, like school meals. You know, how do you get to universal school meal? It just doesn't make sense. So some of those things, this may be the opportunity to push those forward. Mm -hmm. And some of the um, requests from the legislature, and especially or the Congress, I'm sorry, and especially if there is a fourth round of stimulus. That would be the opportunity where a voice and the advocates could have the, an impression to move those things at this time when we might not have been able to move them before. And everybody on the call should know that that's something that uh, Angelina Jolie is actually weighing in on with the letter to the congressional leadership for this next package, which uh, I think will will get some attention. So hopefully it will. That. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Can I just share a little bit um, just to demonstrate? So. Within SNAP, there's something called the fourth week famine. And so families typically run out of their um, food stamp allocation by the end, before the end of the month. And so one of the things that we saw in San Francisco is on our second week of meals, which was around um, the March 20th, we did um, 41,000 meals that week. And by the following week, which was the end of March, we did 90,000 meals. And so that's how much the spike in need went, and that's because food stamps yep. ran out. And so that's what happens every month. And then, so then you put the pandemic on top of it. That's the increase that we saw. So the number of meals that we served more than doubled um, for that. And then you put in particular the the roadblocks that this administration has put on to food stamps since they've come in and you think about um, public charge is one of the things that has happened and which in particular has impacted our families. So if you are an immigrant and you're trying to do the legal process of becoming an American citizen, if you are trying to, if you need food stamps and you apply for food stamps, you run the risk of not being able to become a citizen of this country. And that is something the administration went ahead, I believe, and still put into effect. So you cannot get food stamps even in the middle of this pandemic and still try to become a citizen in this country. And so we're having families who are trying are not even applying for the national school lunch program because they're afraid 
because um, they don't understand that the National School Lunch Program isn't part of the public charge. And so it's this quagmire That's of- the important thing to make, one, to make sure we, that people hear that. I hope people can hear that from you now, that that is yeah. different. Mm -hmm. um, and to be aware of what the administration has done and, and how it's affecting people. And what I'm hearing from you is what you're all seeing, it sounds like to me, and why it's so important for people to, to be aware of your work and hear about it is that you shouldn't be, the, the government, not only from before, should have done enough to, for you not to be needed, right? That's what we all say in <clears throat> humanitarian fields. We all, <clears throat> we all want to not have to do our work, right? We want it, it to be handled in a way because it shouldn't be, you, know, you shouldn't have to be filling in these gaps. These gaps should not be so wide, especially in this country. Um, but what it sounds like is that as the needs have grown with the pandemic, they're really not being met. Um, and so your work is not only the work you usually do, but it is growing and growing, and you're filling in gaps that are, are going to be impossible to meet if the government, or probably already impossible in some ways with everything you're up against, to, meet every, to get to everybody, if the government doesn't start making strong changes um, right now, and especially with all the people who've now lost their job. Yeah. And, and I mean, this is where philanthropy is helping, you know, to, to, yeah. to bridge that gap for, you know, organizations like No Kid that send money and other local philanthropists. So that's where the money's coming from now. Yes. And, and it's and as much as it's wonderful, and you can see as we were talking yeah. about, that's the heart of the country and people yeah. who care. But it, but it can't but be sustained. Yeah. Our tax dollars and our government employees to be, uh, to be doing their job. And... Yeah. Um, so it is, we were talking earlier about how this is a moment to help with the immediate needs and finally draw attention to some of the, the to, to the realities that should have long ago been, been um, addressed and corrected. I think something that's sort of unique with us too is that we have to rely on the state, the, the state government to administer the SNAP benefits. And so it's another layer of, uh, you know, bureaucracy for us to come, um, our, for our people to, you know, participate in that. But then again, we're, we're such isolated area that, you know, a lot of the prices and stuff are, are not adequate. And something that we looked at at One Spirit, that was some of the pr proposed changes that were coming up with the work requirement. Um, you know, we have upwards of 80% unemployment. There just ain't the jobs here. And so we were real concerned that people would be getting cut off their SNAP benefits. And these are even, I mean, just single individuals. There's, there's no other resources available to them um, in, in the work requirement and, and different things like that puts a, a, even a harder, uh, you know, hindrance on people trying to at least feed themselves. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And, and, and I don't just understand why a lot of these hurdles are put into place for, especially these people, the poorest people that need this help are, are have to jump through hoops. Well, and what the, Native, what, what the, you know, what the Native American people have been through in this country is, is a horror. And what, you know, and the restrictions that have been put on. I, I, I remember years ago, and we, it was maybe for a different discussion, but trying to Myself that and got involved with Pine Ridge and with my my mother and John Trudell and different people and, and being being aware and and there were certain things and I said well why why can't this help come in or why can't that help come in or why can't they apply for this and they and then I started to learn about all these restrictions this idea that no no the government takes care of them you know this idea that there's some some other in place that's being taken care of and so therefore they don't they don't have access to all these other things and so they're limited to what is. Um, what is and, and of course, you know what? If I may say, and I maybe it's not my place, but it is so it's so angering and upsetting to hear people talk about. You know, I know from my my friends who are Native American, the the the, the culture, the 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 awareness of the land, the awareness of how to be in this country, work this land, live and eat and survive in this land without restrictions. There's nobody who could do it better. And there's nobody who should be allowed the freedoms to do it in the way they know how to do it and, and be able to, to, to thrive in this land. And so all that's, that's up against all of the tribes is, you know, has, has been done to them. And, um, and I know they're in a, a really tough spot. So I, I really am so glad you're, you're with them. Some of the, you know, the, some of the problems that we face now, like you mentioned about philanthropy coming in and trying to help out, um, you know, a lot of those organizations that you would see normal places, you know, um, different types of organizations that do um, help, you know, that help food banks and help, you know, different things like that. We just don't have them available here. So One Spirit really fills that role of, you know, being that bridge between finding outside help. Like, I mean, with like an example of this call here, being able to set this up and 
you know, bringing awareness to what we're going through because we are still here. For so long, we've been not allowed to be able to do things for ourselves. But like Bam mentioned, we, he built his, this uh, buffalo house. We're able to process our own food for ourselves. We're looking at, a, a, you know, expanding out on our gardening program to be able to grow our own food. We have a vast uh, reservation, you know, it's bigger than some states. And so we have land available. But for so long, we were, we're not in control of our own land to be able to say this is what we want to be able to do here. So now we're, we're, we're finally coming back to be able to hopefully be self-sufficient. That's what we want to be able to have. And like you said, we don't want to be able to just to keep getting handouts. We want to be able to take care of ourselves. And one spirit really allows us to be able to do that. So I'm really, I'm really again, thankful for being part of this call. What a wonderful program. I look forward to learning even more about one spirit. Sounds wonderful. Jennifer, I was going to ask you if, uh, just as we're hearing a little bit more about uh, the community that One Spirit serves. Tell us a little bit about uh, in, in, in San Francisco in an urban school district. What um, what are the families like? What are what are their living situations? What issues are they dealing with that they're so dependent on these um, school assistance programs? Yeah, I think a, a lot of the people think San Francisco and they think wealth and that's just not the case for so many of our families as uh, you know so many of our families are in the situation where they are living paycheck to paycheck and rent is taking up most of that paycheck and even though we have a San Francisco minimum wage um, so many of our families that that minimum wage is going to rent and so many of our families are living in group um, you know multiple living together and a lot of our families are single mothers and their their jobs are gone now and um, a lot of our um, jobs are service economies or um, the families may have had jobs but now because schools are closed the parents are having to care for their children and doing school you know and taking care of that so they can't necessarily work anymore and so our families are becoming ever dependent on the school meal program and so one of the things that we are seeing is that on a normal school week, we are normally serving 150,000 meals a week. And um, now we're serving close to 100 plus, 100,000 plus. And so that we're keeping pace with that. And we're doing that in only 18 sites. And we're normally doing that at over 136 sites. So wow. we're really seeing a dramatic change with what we're doing. And um, Instead of doing um, Monday through Friday service, we're doing Monday and Wednesday service so that we can help parents do shelter in place. Um, we're doing service on Monday and they're picking up Monday and Tuesday meals and on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday meals. And so we've really just created a whole new system of how we're um, providing meal service to our families. And it's been a whole new world for us and the families really do appreciate it. Um, we're getting these amazingly heartfelt emails and um, notes from the children. And um, especially with our door-to-door -door service, it's really something where we're able to provide that level of service to families, especially with students having severe allergies, um, everything from um, um, gluten-free diets to um, allergy um, with dairy where they could not access that food because it's so expensive to get or the stores don't have it, we're able to provide those foods for the students. And even with our um, families where, because the students' disabilities, they can't leave the homes to go get the food. So very similar to what's going on in Tampa, we're being able to um, work with our San Francisco Unified School District employees to make those deliveries. And so it's something that is really being able to have an impact and with no kid hungry, they're able to help us to support those types of services. So we're really appreciative to continue to have the partnership with them. Thanks, and speaking of Tampa, Caitlin, how does uh, what Jennifer just described align with your community? We're on the coast and a lot of the jobs are um, tourism fueled. And so, you know, just in two days, there were over 50,000 unemployment applications filed. Um, you know, and there's a million people in Pinellas County. And, and so we've seen just a significant increase in need and it's people that lost their jobs literally overnight and we're living paycheck to paycheck. And we know, thanks to the uh, data and research from United Way, the ALICE population, the a asset limited income constrained and employed, about 50% of everybody, of all people living in Tampa and Tampa Bay area, um, are living paycheck to paycheck. So I think somebody else was talking about, you know, these folks were struggling 
before COVID and, and that, and, and they couldn't afford to save, they could afford the mortgage, they could afford, you know, the, to put clothes on their kids back. But, um, uh, but if, if something happens, you know, like, like this, they lose a job, they get into a car accident, they get sick, divorced, something um, that affects their, their financial situation. They're thwarted into this downward spiral where usually the first bill affected is their food bill. And then it tends to be, you know, the car payment, insurance, and mortgage. But um, that's something that we're preparing for in our community is, you know, the stimulus, stimulus checks or it's only one check. And, and I mean, it's a blessing to many, don't get me wrong, but, you know, just thinking long-term, you know, people won't eventually be able to pay the mortgages and utility bills and no way to pay them. And, and I know there are a lot of great programs, but it's not, it's, it's not comprehensive. It's not for everybody. Yes, it will help a lot of people, but it's those people that, that we're, you know, serving that, that do fall through the cracks. So, but yeah, it's, it's a tourism run industry. So we're hurting pretty badly right now. Um, and, and like I said before, pre COVID, you know, 50% were living paycheck to paycheck and employed. So these people are working uh, sometimes multiple jobs and, and it, it's, so we are in the same situation where we don't have the industry. We don't have the jobs to really meet the needs for these people to be able to afford a livelihood without relying on the charitable emergency feeding system um so it's but anyway so 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 yes it's we're seeing significant <laughs> um increase in in need and it's primarily due with the uh, overnight job loss do you have and i imagine all of you have very good relationships with the school systems how's how how has that been is that very organized at least the school systems and the and the outreach to to them and the way to use the campuses even if needed or yeah so we partner with um we partner with uh, the school districts very closely to strategically um, uh, feed the families that can't get to the school sites. So um, we really want, and, and, and we work with them to help get the, the messaging out. Um, we were going to try to do a grocery giveaway because the schools are giving away like a prepackaged lunch meal and we were going to do a grocery giveaway um, at, at the school sites, but weren't allowed due to COVID because they didn't want non-school employees um on the campus at the time and so but but it's a great relationship though um with the schools and and they're doing a great job at least in our area of, of setting up the site and and giving out the food it's just we have to remember for every child there is well most of the time a head of household and that's one of the issues too is that a lot of these programs are not geared towards feeding the family they're geared towards just feeding the child and i've been at several, um, you know, break spot sites where the parent will bring the child and is left standing there, not able to eat with their child and, and, and enjoy that meal with their child. And so, um, but, but it's, it, um, but yes, it's a great relationship with the school and, uh, and, and, and they're doing a great job and, and they're great partners and we work strategically with them to try and really help fill in the gaps. Um, by doing that home delivered uh, grocery meal program. Yeah. yeah, I would certainly like to, to second what she's saying that schools are doing a good job, but also to say that I truly support what she's saying about the focus being on the kids. Of course, the kids have to eat and it's very important that they have the food that they need in order to grow and develop. But absolutely, the parents and other members of the family are watching even at now as schools hand out meals, they're handing out meals for the kids but not for the entire family. And even before the COVID, uh, you know, they were sending backpacks home, but backpacks were home, sent home over the weekend for kids. You know, we, we certainly have to take into consideration the whole family in a place like, like uh, not only in Pine Ridge, and I'm sure in all other areas, you know, parents and grand, in, in Pine Ridge particularly, many, many grandparents take care of grandchildren and many grandchildren. And often it's the grandparents who will go without food in order to be sure that the kids have it, even when the schools are not are not supplying the food. So, but we, if we're going to take this as a whole and, and support families, we need to be sure that there's enough food for all, uh, not to have it 
Yeah, to just give to the kids, which is important. I don't mean to take away from that at all. It's, it's so important that the kids have the food, uh, but we must support the family. Yeah, I have a question. I, you know, I, I really don't know how, I only know food distribution from, from field work at, at a situation where it's like 300,000 people displaced in one area and have to be fed for, for years. And you have these markers, they have a, you know, there's a breakdown of X amount of protein, X amount of what, what stays longer, whether it's beans, whether it's rice, how to do, you know. Um, so forgive my ignorance. What is the, um, what, what is the food? How do you, how do you get the, if that makes sense? Like, what is the food that can, can help feed? What is the best food when you stock up, right? You don't stop stock up on, you, you know, what, what is it that, that lasts? What is it if you said, I hope, I wish every household had food, what is it that every household a month would say this, if they had at least this, this is, this meets a certain level of protein and calorie and base? Is that how it works? Yeah, or? I would go back to what one of the foods, uh, one of the programs that, that uh, No Kid Hungry or Share Our Strengths talks about, which is Cooking Matters. And the families there really, uh, the families I'm sure in all of our homes, want to be able to take care of their kids in a way that provides nutritious foods. Uh, unfortunately, and the food banks will tell you this, a lot of things that get do donated are not nutritious foods. You know, they do get a lot of high sugar, highly processed foods, and the Native Americans, and I'm sure many other people, uh, are suffering from this because of the diet-related disease. And I, there's just one example where, you know, more than 50% of uh, people on Pine Ridge Reservation uh, are affected by diabetes, right, or heart disease, or other diet-related problems, and that's why if Bam talks to me about bringing back the buffalo and the traditional diet, and that's what he was all about, bringing this back where they could have what was traditionally uh, a healthy food diet. So, so you're very dependent. What you get in order to distribute is very dependent also on these donations of what kind of food. So no, we're not. You're not, you're not. So that's just one part of what gets donated. But that's what the food banks have, and, and I'm sure it's what people have that we have to give out. But we have, we have since we began, we, just, we gave only uh, fresh meat, fresh produce, uh, we did not, and uh, fresh fruit. We did not go and, for others. Right. And, and, and sorry, but just about like the base for, for family, because I think there is something, I'm just trying to, maybe yeah. it's a different question, but understand how to, how to tell a family? I mean, listen, I'm, I'm trying. I was trying to stock my figure out what is it I'm supposed to have when everybody said you get groceries. You go and then you know <laughs> we had a big yeah, question about our house. Yeah, right. Our house, like, yeah, right. Half right. Our house like, think toilet paper is not necessary as a necessity, and then half think it's like the you know there was a whole talk about leave. So we we went to a whole discussion, but but uh, you know what what are the things? And we ended up with like you know it's the bag of beans, bag of rice. Mm -hmm. Um, so, as I said, Catherine, there, there are food banks that have high commitments to protein, but the hierarchy is protein, dairy, produce, right? That you need those three things in some way, whether they be perishable or mm -hmm. non-perishable. I think the challenge, you know, we, that we are, those are the items that we have mostly because we have a nutrient quality policy, but as noted, not all food banks do because they're dependent on donations. We buy a sizable amount That's of our wonderful. food yeah. so you can, you know, dictate the content and the quality, but, um, but that would be the hierarchy. So what are those protein sources, which include beans, but they could be yep. in non-perishable canned salmon, canned chicken, canned tuna, a number mm -hmm. of things. But if, if you go to the perishable side, that's harder. And in COVID right now, the response to get food to people, you have to employ the distancing, you have to do a number of things. So there's a lot of prepared boxes and there are uh, programs across the country that do dietary prepared boxes for folks as well as therapeutic meals. Uh, but these are all put in place, but they do vary across yeah. the country based on resources. And based Amazing. on all, all you have to consider, all that you're working yeah. on, how, com how complicated, you know, the... Yeah, the and, all you have, and, and the immigrant population in terms of ethnicity and, and uh, choice of food. And, and but, so there's so many factors, but, I, but now, right now, it's food, to your point. It's move food into those systems as much as possible and then move perishable food 
with that system. The larger it is, it's it's more it's just more complicated. That's all. It's all logistics, and you know we we would uh, we can't lose sight that the supply chain is also impacted. Whether that is a preparer of school meals or a preparer of you know um, you know the food bank getting access to food or just even retailers. So there is some disruption occurring, but for the most part, I think people are doing the best they can with the sources they have. Um, Wonderful people. You know, and, and certainly all the meat, we've, we've been hearing more recently that the meat uh, producing uh, facilities are, are now closing down, you know, yeah. that, that, uh, that they've been affected so harshly by the COVID that, yeah. uh, that they're not operating anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, that out where we are, uh, you know, one of the things that we're very, very careful about, the, and to go back just to one thing that they said about people wanting to, to take care of themselves and being able to bring them in and have them have them take care of themselves, right? So on, on the reservation, Bam is handling the, the buffalo, Steve is doing the distributing and, and doing it in a safe way. The women are sewing masks, you know, they're doing all they can to prevent uh, to do a prevention as well as having now the cleaning supplies available. Will it help? Will there be meat? Will we be able to keep the meat uh, production safe? We hope so. You know, one of the things that we're very focused on with the No Kid Hungry campaign is, uh, has always been, how do we figure out whatever barrier exists between a hungry child or family and a healthy meal and how do we knock that down? You know, one of the kind of commonalities of uh, in this conversation is that you know, we, by and large, we have the food in this country, uh, but there have been lots of obstacles for people accessing it in ways they need to before COVID and now even uh, greater obstacles. So one of the things I would just like to invite uh, folks to do, um, our, our job at Share Strength has been to generate resources for those of you on the front line. Angelina Jolie's been playing an indispensable role for us in helping us generate resources by raising this awareness. If there's obstacles that you think we should be focusing on, um, you know, we've talked about uh, SNAP and the importance of changing that, and we'll circulate Angelina Jolie's letter to everybody once that is uh, finalized and sent. But if there's other obstacles that you think we should be focusing on, if there's other ways we could be helping your organizations, uh, please don't hesitate to push us. Just one, one, I just had one thought about something that I think needs to be looked at is increasing the income limits for SNAP. Uh, Florida, it's 200%, I believe, of poverty. Um, and though a lot of people are unemployed, there's still a lot of people that are working and are suffering because, you know, now they're thwarted into a single um, income family and, you know, they're struggling, but because they make a little bit of money, they're not eligible for SNAP. Mm -hmm. So increasing the income limits is just the other thing um, that I think would, would help uh, the struggling families empower them with their own, uh, you know, uh, funds to, to go and purchase their own food and also help relieve the burden on the emergency feeding system to help uh, fill the gaps, you know, that's where the families can't go out and buy the food. So if we could just increase the access to SNAP, uh, I think it would just help everybody. Yeah, that's a great point, Caitlin, and that's something we keep coming back to because that's the way that families have the most options to make their own choices and what's in the best interest of their families to have those SNAP resources um, as opposed to, you know, being dependent on so much of what we're doing to make sure that we kind of fill those gaps. Uh, Angeline, anything else at your end? No, I mean, I feel like I've just had a, a I feel very fortunate to have a great education from all of you directly from from the front line, and um, I I believe this is the beginning of a much longer conversation and working together. And I'm I'm here, so I will. Um, I I you have so much ahead of you. I know everything. You'll I'll be thinking about you in the months ahead, and I am standing by if I can help. But um, just a lot of respect um, and gratitude to all of you. And uh, I'm so, so happy for all those children that they have, they have you thinking about them and trying to find solutions and all of those families there. You know, I know I'm, you really are making such a huge difference to the lives of all of these families. And it's, uh, it's very nice to meet all of you. Thank you. You too. Well, thank you. I thank you. I can't say it. I can't say it better than you just did. So thank you, Angelina. Thanks for 
uh, bringing us all together today and for being so supportive. 